say we are absolutely gobsmacked and honoured to have Martin Hayes in our mix. When we, when we started planning the Pala, one of my colleagues, Yvonne, wasn't happy until we had Martin Hayes on the bill. So yeah, he, he has a book published, so we were absolutely uh, thrilled to find an, an angle for the library. So not only has he got his fiddle here today, but he will talk about his book hopefully as well. Uh, alongside Martin, I cannot forget uh, Toner Quinn. Uh, Toner Quinn is a musician, writer, editor, publisher and lecturer. And he has the welcome task of uh, introducing you to Martin Hayes and to talking to him this afternoon. Well, it is my pleasure today to be conducting this uh, public chat with Martin. And uh, we have met many times over the years, but we've never actually had a chance to have a chat like this. So I'm looking forward to it. And um, I'm sure that all of you are quite aware of Martin's work. And why wouldn't you be? And that's why you're here. But just to, to recap, Martin has been, over the past 30 years, you know, through his recordings and concerts, has been inspiring audiences within traditional music but also expanding the audience for traditional music and expanding the vocabulary even for traditional music through his solo work, through his work with the late guitarist Dennis Cahill, or Cahill as I think you pronounced it, yeah. And uh, with the gloaming of course, many of you may be aware of the gloaming and the Martin Hayes Quartet. And most recently with the Common Ground Ensemble and he's gonna be performing later on and of course that's sold out. But we'll ask Martin a little bit about that concert. Um, but at the heart of all, he's been on, on this extraordinary journey over the past 30 years, but at the heart of it all is his fiddle playing, his solo fiddle playing, you know, and the music he learned from his community of musicians growing up in Fecal County Clare, so I'm going to ask him about that. The plan it, today is we have about an hour. Uh, towards the end, we're going to open it out to the floor. You won't have a microphone, you'll have to shout, but I want you to be thinking about some questions that you can ask Martin Hayes. I don't know when you'll get a chance to ask them again, and particularly young musicians that are here. If you have a question about Martin's music, or your own music, and you want to ask Martin about it, please be thinking about that as well. So, uh, without further ado, just please welcome Martin again. <laughs> Martin, where do we start? Let's start with why you're here at the Flat Kyo, which is this this concert tonight. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that for people who can't get a ticket at this stage? Well, um, yeah, uh, why am I here? Uh, the, well, it turns out uh, that the bishop here is, is a neighbour of mine uh, from, <laughs> from East Clare, uh, Gerard Nash. And uh, both the sound engineer who's with me tonight and I, we, we would have known Gerard long, long before he became a priest even. So. Um, we're as surprised to see him as a bishop as anybody. <laughs> but, uh, so, so uh, but the previous two flag holes, I, I had a fan, a bishop in, in Mullingar, and he he insisted on having me play at the last couple of flags. So we were saying, well, we know the next bishop now. <laughs> so, so this is how it came about in so many ways. Like it was just directly from the church. Okay. <laughs> here in that sense, you know. So that's that's how it has happened. Okay. And and who are you playing with this evening? I'm playing with uh, there's a concertina player uh, from East Clare, um, Brian Donlan, and his grandfather and my father would have been in the Tolly Kelly band back in 1946, and uh, they played together as young men. And so now I'm playing with uh, with his grandson. And uh, he's just a fabulous player, and he, he has all of the repertoire of East there that I'm familiar with, and, and the rhythms and the pulses. And there's a, a young gu guitar player called Conroe Kane, who's who, from Philadelphia, who teaches guitar at UL, and uh, performs with a band called Geist, I think it's the name. Oh, Goethe. Goethe, I'm not yeah, yeah. sure. But not. Yeah. See, okay, you read it, but you don't pronounce it. <laughs> you have to pronounce it one day. So uh, anyway, yeah. So he's so it's it's a trio. We've done a few concerts. We were down in New Zealand earlier in the year yeah. for, for an arts festival, and 
I just really enjoy playing with them. They're, they're, they're wonderful players. Okay. So you're here as a matter of faith. Okay, we've established that. Um, <laughs> but let's talk about this extraordinary occasion, which is the Flack Hole. And um, your book was mentioned earlier on, which is Shared Notes, which I, I read a couple of years ago as well. And in Shared Notes, there, there's some passages where Martin talks about the Flack Hole. They were kind of significant experiences for you. Um, can you talk a little bit about those? Yeah, they, they, they were like, I, I suppose before I'd ever gotten to an All Ireland flag, um, my, my father had, had talked about the various flag holes of his youth, and, uh, and one of them was Gory. There was a, a, flag, a famous flag hole in Gory that my father talked about. And so I had this whole thing about, like, this was a, a mythical event, like, I needed to be at a flag hole. So it was, it was built up. And eventually, the only way to really get to the flag hole was to qualify in competition. And hence obliged your parents to take you there. And uh, so the first flag was in Bunkrana that, that I, I went to up in Donegal. And I was driven up there by, by my uncle, uh, James McMahon. And his son, John, uh, is here somewhere. That's right. And John and I were, were in a, a duet competition uh, in Bukhana for the flag. We didn't succeed. But uh, I think I forgot how many times the tune was to be replayed, and I, you know, it didn't go well. And my, I apologise, John. I don't know if I ever apologised to you before for that. But anyway, uh, uh, but so that was the the first flag hole, and, and I, I competed in the fiddle as well. It was I would have been, it was the under fourteen fiddle competition, but it was like it was a, 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 and I I won it much to my surprise, and I I kind of, it was a, a boost of confidence that uh, kind of stayed with me my whole life, I think, you know, it was kind of that moment where I felt, God, you know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm out all right at this, actually, you know, <laughs> this, it, so I, 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 it became a question probably of identity, like I identified as a musician, I thought of myself as a musician <coughs> more than anything, and, um, and, Loved the music, loved the scene, loved the people, loved the environment, loved, you know, just getting to know the, the wider community of musicians and stuff. And just, it, it's place, the place I felt I belonged, you know. Yeah. But you say, <clears throat> you're being modest about it because the way you write about it in the book, and, you know, I looked at the book just the other day, but I remember the passage anyway. Um, and you write about what happened at this particular competition was that a lot of sort of show pieces were played. Yeah. And then, but you drew on your rooted tradition, and it was almost countercultural at that stage, even then, it seemed to me, the way you wrote about it. Yeah. <clears throat> but then you said that you just went up and you sank into the music and played out into the world, which is still what I try to do today. Yeah. So you had that approach at 14. Yeah, I, I did. I, 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 a lot of the things that... I learned to do when I was very young, I think kind of happened accidentally, you know, I, I just kind of, like, the way I learned music, you know, my father was a fiddle player, and so there was lots of music around, but there weren't really classes as such, the, like, it was only a rare number of occasions when we actually sat down across from each other and he tried to teach me some tunes, so there, there was a lot of talk about music for sure, and you, you, I mean, Ultimately, you had to find your own way into this, you know, and so this was my way of, like, it was kind of, music was escape, it was kind of escapism, you know, I could, I could kind of get immersed in music and get lost and, like, have a really good time with that and enjoy being just lost in a piece of music. And then I think that, that became kind of what I did then, that, that, that's how I started to play. And, and there was a lot of talk about um, feeling in music, which is like, in, in some terms, like an abstract kind of thought, you know, like, well, what do you mean by feeling, or what is feeling? But it's actually a physical thing. It's, it's a visceral feel. You feel music. You feel it in your body. And, um, and, and it's, it's a kind of an emotional gateway. You can begin to feel... Uh, kind of tenderness or 
joy or sadness or you know all kinds of mixtures of that you know as, as if like it could contain all of those things at once in some kinds and you know whatever kind of a teenager I was I, I liked that now I, I suppose being that kind of a teenager makes you a little bit odd <laughs> a, little, a little bit you, you know you're, you're you're in your own world a little bit you know so you, you kind of um, you know I, I I think it troubled me a lot that, that, that uh, at the time the music wasn't that widely appreciated and understood, you know, not like I was all in on it, like, you know, so, mm. but anyway, but it was good to learn how to navigate that world as well, you know, where, yeah. where it wasn't that appreciated. Yeah, you, you write about that kind of the alienation from school and connecting in with the music community, which is where you find your identity, but, um, is there a tune from your teenage years that you still enjoy playing that you can think of that maybe you didn't <laughs> play for us now? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, in fact, a lot of them <coughs> stay with me. Mm. Yeah. Uh, let me think. I'll, I'll, I'll play it. Tune come from the repertoire of your father, or who? No, I, I got that like like a lot of people. I, I had records too, and I just sat down and went through them. This was a record of Sean Ryan, Pat Lyons, and Sean Ryan's wife. Right. I think it was called "Return to the Cliffs of Moher" or something. Like a different Tipperary. I don't know why the album was called "Return to the Cliffs of Moher," but but somebody in marketing somewhere thought that was a good thing to do. And uh, well, yeah. I I would have learned most of the tunes on that album. But I have to ask, and I know not everyone here will be a, a musician, but for the musicians after that, you're playing that in G minor. Yeah. And is that the way you learned it? Or did you, there seems to have been something about the musical culture of your area that that key was used a lot. Yeah, it, G minor is like, uh, it's slightly sadder than like just straight up D or A or something yeah, yeah. like that. And, um, I'll tell you a little interesting story about it. Are you familiar with the speech project, that Jerry Dyer? Yes, I am, yeah. Yeah, okay. So, so he called me up this one time, like he wanted to conduct an interview. And like, like this, you know, I, I sometimes say yes, and I have no idea what I'm actually saying yes to. And I go, it'll be fine. Whatever the interview is, I don't, I don't mind. Like, well, I'll talk. So I'm talking, but I, I didn't realize that he was actually recording me to use my voice as part of a musical project that I somehow missed and um, so I didn't know 
uh, while I was talking about that, I'm just answering his questions, but he's recording my voice and he's using the kind of the cadence and the pitch of my language to kind of trigger a piece of classical music, really, uh, that, that responds to the, you know, the rhythm of my language and, you know, the pitches. Anyway, long story short, I talk in G minor. <laughs> We've no so, way of testing no. that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. But did you transpose that tune to G minor? I know we're getting technical. No, I didn't. Sorry, I, I diverted them. Yeah. I, I didn't actually. I think they played in they G played minor. They played in G minor. And, uh, okay. Yeah. But the, the, there were plenty of tunes um, in, in other keys that I, I would, you know, put in maybe C or F or yeah. in flat sometimes. Um, did and you do that purposefully because of the it. tone and the sound yeah, creates, and, right? Yeah, I was looking for a deeper sadness every time. And, <laughs> and, and, and I, I, I kind of say that half joking, but I actually I think that was actually true. Um, I, like the, the kind of, like the way in which would, one would feel blues, for example, or, or any form of music seemed to be a way of feeling that was the, the first gateway into the feeling of music for me was that kind of experience. Like, like for, if I play it, you know, I'll, I'll do something here. You know, like, you know, here's the books of one more. in favour of B flat there, but I get more feeling on the B flat moment for some reason, or I'm able to access something because of that. And so I, I would, and then I, I took to tuning my fiddle down as well, okay. because in, in previous eras, uh, like m musical instruments weren't pitched at 440, they were pitched sometimes at 432, sometimes for, you know, 416, like in earlier years, and all violins had different length necks originally uh, to kind of care for that. But there was something in that old sound that I also found very appealing. And it's something that even I, I still find appealing in early Baroque music and stuff that I just, that there's something about the lower pitch that uh, is like a little more soothing to the soul in some way, you know? But was that, you know, why were you looking for this deeper sadness? Were you trying to reflect the musical culture around you, what you learnt, or was this something that wasn't in the culture around you that you were looking for? Ah uh, no, it, it was it was it was in the culture. I mean, like you know, people like Martin Rochford, like who wouldn't be very well known, and well, maybe technically not an not a, a very accomplished fiddle player, but he had like a wonderful sensibility around it. A, a wonderful understanding and, and like a real yearning for that feeling. So I could always hear that in his music. Um, I could also hear it in like the music of Tony McMahon, for example. Um, I could always hear it in the music of Julia Crehan and, uh, and lots and lots of these players. And that became the thing that I was drawn to. That became kind of definitive, definitive of the music for me, you know. So, that, so that's why I ended up Keeping, keeping on going down that road, you know? Okay. Um, that real Tommy Cohen's, you recorded that, is the very last tune on the first album that you made, as I remember, the first solo album that you made, which would have been at the beginning of the 1990s. And, um, you know, that album, the way you write about it in the book, that album was the sort of end point of a sort of huge creative journey that you'd been on when you left Ireland, leaving your roots behind, moving to the United States, and that album was some arriving somewhere. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I suppose, like, when anybody gets to make, make their first album, it's, 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 it's a, summa a summation of your entire musical life to that point. That never happens again. Like, you, you know, you, you get another year and a half and repeat, <laughs> off you go, but, uh, but, but it was also kind of like, for me, an important moment to kind of come to some, 
to be to well to be honest, to kind of try and put the right foot forward as well, and to actually do something that I that that I I felt I could be proud of for a long time. You know that that it wouldn't be in a year and a half I'd be going, oh my God, I shouldn't have made that. Why why did you know? I I wanted it to be, and the only thing I knew that I could do with that was to, you know. Be, be truthful to who, who I am, you know, and and to what I know, and to, uh, or, and I followed some advice from people, which was don't try to be like better than you are when you go into the studio. That's unlikely to happen, mm-hmm. and uh, um, uh, you know, or just be yourself. You know, like that was really what I think I learned from that experience. Yeah, but the way you write about it in the book. You write a lot about the creative process in the book and about creativity and about giving yourself over to creativity. And I'm just wondering, where did that come from? I don't imagine that your father said, give yourself over to the creative process, Martin. You know? So, like, were there people, mentors, books, musicians you met along the way that pushed you in that direction? Uh, well, like, how would I say it? Um, there the, the was kind of a turning point in... Uh, in Chicago for me, you know, um, where I, I think I had partied and drank and lived as wild a life mm-hmm. as I could for as long as possible, mm-hmm. as long as I could sustain it. And I, I got to a point where I, I saw, you know, this is not going to work. The, 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 I have to change. Right. So, yeah, so, I, I, so I, I changed a lot of things. Right. Like I, 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 I got really curious about, you know, philosophically, spiritually, musically, every way. I, I kind of said, everything is up for questioning now, everything, okay. you know, so, so it was, like, and I remember I had this journey with traditional music, which, which, where I was saying to myself, I wonder is this just like, is this any good really? It, uh, um, was all this stuff about this melancholic music and all these things, that maybe that's just, sentimentality, you know, like maybe I'm just feeling attached because of family and, and maybe I, I can't separate my sentimentality from, you know, from, from what's real and what's not real, you know. Mm. And uh, so, so, like, I think to feel empowered to play music, you have to ask some questions, like, is it any good? Well, there's no point in asking that question if you can't accept the answer. You can't. You'd ha- I'd have to be willing to accept that, you know what, it's not that good, Irish music, forget about it, you know. So I, w- I was willing to accept that if, if that was the outcome of, like, really investigating it further, you know. So, so I think that um, in, 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 in the end I did kind of, you know, sort it out in Chicago, you know, I kind of, like, I, I would, I would, and I would say I would have, like, Where's your national? I would have I would have given the Catholic Church the same kind of analysis, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and um, uh, you know, you know, lots of lots of things like that. You yeah. know, I would I would have like you know held up like it would have been the first time politically where you know like I would have grown up in a Finnafall family house, you know. Yeah. So so people would think you're you're your Finnafall. Well, I I didn't get to choose that like that kind of happened to me, you know, like or something. But then in America, it's gone. Well, what do I actually believe politically? You know, like where do I, so I got to kind of refigure my values and my principles and, and what I felt and thought about there. So, so you know, so I had some great years in Chicago of kind of rediscovering and being willing to change and being willing to uh, challenge just about anything. You know, and so that came as a result of of a community of people. Yeah, I I just seemingly had like a lot of very interesting curious people in my circle that we spent a lot of time, like late at night, like debating and just going through all of these kind of things. You know? Is there uh, a tune from that time in Chicago that you can think of that you might like to play? Ah, I, 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 I don't like it. No, there's a tune specifically, but what should we do? What is the Chicago read?
Um, I can't even see it, I'm sure. <laughs> anyway, you, in Chicago, you started playing with Dennis Cahill, um, the late Dennis Cahill, and I wanted to ask about uh, Dennis because the two of you playing together had such a huge impact and it was an extraordinary musical partnership. But again, in the book, you know, you talk, you write about when you start, first started playing with Dennis and you're rehearsing in a hotel room for your first gig to together or something, or you're just starting to play together. And you asked Dennis something which always stays in my mind. You said, you write something like, um, I asked Dennis to go in service of the tune with me, not to accompany you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, it, it's, it's a small point, like, but it's an important point, you know. Uh, just musically overall, uh, as to, like, one, you, you know, it's very easy to over-focus on, on the musician and the playing, and it being about the musician. Whereas, of course, in true reality, it, it, it's always about the piece of music. And, uh, and so, like, if you decide that you do what you need to do to reveal what is natural and beautiful in a piece of music, then, then, then you you kind of can see a roadmap, you know, of, of what of what you would have to do for that to actually become true. But but it often means that um, you're you're playing some very simple things at times, you know, very uh, childlike things almost. In a way. In fact, I would say over time I play simpler and simpler and simpler. You know, I don't I don't know where this is headed, but uh, it's, it's, um, <laughs> I, 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 I find myself putting less into the tunes on that more. You know. Do you actually find that in your own music that it's becoming simpler and simpler? Yeah, yeah, it's becoming more and more basic, and I go, are people going to reject this? I mean, what, people are saying, he can't play. <laughs> no, I, I'd actually disagree with you, actually, but anyway. I mean, just from listening to Mark, from listening, I, was, I heard you play at the National Concert Hall during the pandemic when you had to do a solo concert, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. And I thought your music was actually becoming more complex. Right. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's me just getting more simple. <laughs> <laughs> no, maybe, or maybe it was the pandemic. Um, but how did Dennis, you know, did you actually verbalise that or was it sort of just a roundabout conversation? Did you ever say to Dennis, this is what we're doing, you know? Yeah, no, I did. Like, we really talked it through and, and thought about it. And because one of the things was like, uh, and he knew this too, that he was going to do some ridiculously simple things that uh, would be so simple that, that many others wouldn't be willing to do it. But that's actually complicated when you think about it because it requires a lot of self-confidence to actually do very minimal and simple things and do it on a stage in front of a lot of people. Uh, because I, I do remember like in the early years there was somebody like that just like thought it was the most ridiculous thing they'd ever heard, like these, like four or five notes every now and again, like coming on the guitar, going, bing, 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 and I'm playing away, you know? Yeah. And people thinking, well, what's this about? But of course, I mean, you, you can hear lots and lots of examples of things like that in other forms of music, you know? And so I wonder, well, why, why don't we do that? I mean, one of the things that I, I became central for me was the idea of scaling back to what's naturally beautiful in a melody. And, and letting the melody actually do the, do the talking, you know, in a sense, and just, like, instead of, like, focusing on one's playing, to focus on the natural beauty, the, the, the natural beauty of Irish tunes. And it's an enormous treasury of beauty. Like, the, there are thousands and thousands of incredible melodies that I find just, that, that is what the treasure is. It's not just the players, it's, it's the, like, lines of melody that have been created over such a long period of time that are so beautiful. And sometimes I, I, I'll sit up on the stage and I am utterly reliant on what is naturally beautiful in the thing itself. Mm. So then it doesn't matter about my fiddle playing so much. And in the case of Dennis, it didn't matter so much about his guitar playing. People walk out and think, oh, I think he was amazing music. Really. But uh, that we were amazing players, but we weren't really amazing players. It, it was more that the tunes were amazing, and they looked amazing, and they sounded amazing in a way because, we, like, for example, like, Tolliban would have played it. <laughs> just play 
take a brace. Average listener, and even for non-traditional enthusiasts of this music, that actually the melody itself is quite beautiful, and it's universally beautiful. And in that sense, I can play that tune if I rely on its beauty in Japan or in Wexford. It doesn't make a difference. Yeah. Okay. The simplicity of the tunes I understand and stripping them back. But there's, there was another side to your partnership with Dennis, which was the sets became longer and longer and more complex and the arrangements were incredibly sophisticated, sometimes lasting 20, 30 minutes long, even longer sometimes. Can you tell me a little bit about how those long sets developed and what was driving that? Now, if you've, if you've listened to any of Martin's recordings or the Gloaming's recordings, you'll know what I'm talking about. There's very, very long sets, and they were kind of unprecedented on recordings. Yeah. Uh, well, I think, you know, I mean, there were a lot of recordings, um, like Miles Davis albums and stuff, like there were one track per side, <laughs> you know, like uh, of an album. Like, so I got used to kind of hearing these epic things, and I thought, oh, that could be interesting. Um, and it also came with the idea of, you, you know, if when I would perform a concert and I would, you know, if you play two tunes and you stop, play two tunes again and stop, two, two, I go, okay, like this stop start stuff, like is, it's all right for a while, but like, uh, but it, it's making the night feel long. And I, I, I wanted to kind of throw people off the scent, like I wanted people to get confused about how much time is passing here. And um, like my, my brother complains to me after, after like he'd heard one of these long epic things, he goes, yeah, but I, I, the problem is I can't remember what happened first, like, you know, and I go, exactly the point. You, you actually just can't like remember what I played, like, which is great. And, and you don't have time to check your watch. And, uh, and the, 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 there's, like, there's a kind of a, a suspension of time in the concert, and like, the concert feels like it's over. And I, I don't want people going, I hope the concert is over soon. You know, like, I, I, I want them to, to be surprised that it's over. You know? And, uh, uh, you know, because like, that's, a, that's a subtle matter in performance, like the, uh, how time moves in, in a performance, and um, whether one f like has a strong sense of time moving. So the, the large medleys helped get past that. Because I, I would come out for the second half of a concert and go, there's just two sets on the, on the, on the, on the piece of paper. And I go, okay, so we're done. Like I would actually psychologically feel like the concert was, was, was nearly finished and I, and I was only halfway through. And, and that would impact me somehow, you know. I would kind of think very differently about the thing I'm doing then for some, for some reason. Yeah. So those, those long sets, though, can we talk a little bit about, technically, how you actually move through them? Because uh, there must be a lot of restraint involved. You're sort of like the Olympic runner hanging on to the last lap or something like that. Like, what about the technical aspect in preparing yourself for those long sets? Yeah, well, one of the, one of the things that, like, trying to sustain um, medium tempo music for a long time is tricky. 
Uh, but I discovered a little secret in, in it, like which was like a kind of particular rhythm and pulse. And 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 there's a difference between rhythm and pulse and keeping time, which is a lot of a lot of times we just keep time. But to actually generate a rhythmic response to a list in a listener that is um, that happens unconsciously that that you you the the, the other person reacts to the rhythm and feels it. Uh, for example, if I, I play a slow tune okay. with, with a bit of pulse, I play it without the pulse first. Mm -hmm. And then I put that, and it's very subtle, but it means I can play the tune four times as opposed to two times. Okay. Yeah. So, like Paddy Fahey, like we were. like the stamina involved in those long sets that's what I'm wondering about oh. how you thought through that like and how you prepared yourself for it well it, and how you maintain that stamina if, if you listen to um, the uh, the first album that Dennis and I did the, the Lonesome Touch like there's a, a 12 or 13 minute piece like right and so I go okay that, that's I, I like doing that like so so it started out a little less ambitious you know but, and then I had another one or two sets for live gigs that were that length. And then one day I joined two of them together, you know, and I gone, woohoo, okay. Uh, so, so we have a whole half hour of it. Well, it, 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 it's kind of, um, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's kind of this idea of, um, of, of, of ebb and flow and kind of peaks and valleys in, in, in a performance strategically. Uh, like, I, I heard about this, uh, maybe it's a Japanese theatrical idea, you know, there's a whole language that goes with this that I don't remember or have, but it's kind of this idea of, 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 of a performance being set up in groups of three, like, so you go, like, so, of intensity, so you go level one, level two, level three, intensity, then you drop back, would you only drop back to level two? level two, level three, level four, then you drop back down to boom, boom. And then you could actually go all the way back to the other one. So, so, so sometimes I would, I would have kind of tunes that are medium tempo and I would kind of sit in there for a while and I, I would actually then maybe, you know, ramp it up very subtly, you know? Like for example, like that, like that penny fanny tune is like very gentle and it just carries you along kind of in a nice comfortable gait, you know. But if I play like the Charlie Lennon tune, for example, like the the Vault of Cash, it yeah. changes like you get like that. So, so, yeah. Sorry, I come out of Penny Face. <laughs>
that's somewhere in the middle of all of this and allow yourself the space to go below it, to go above it. But you can set that point, like you can decide how loud things are, how loud your fiddle is, and you can play louder and quieter than that. You can play faster and slower than that. So, so being very conscious about the tempo you pick, because sometimes people just don't think about the tempo. They just lash into it like, mm. and uh, you go, no, well, th then you've run out of options, like, you know, mm -hmm. so, so the, the gig will be harder to manage unless you can manage that, you know, like, and say, okay, these reads are going to go at this tempo. So before I would touch the fiddle at all, like, I'd have the tune, I, I, I'd be kind of sitting in the groove of that tune before I started, you know. Okay. Um, uh, let me see, I think it's about quarter two, so I'm going to come to questions. In a, in a minute or so, so if you want to have a think about that. But um, let me just ask you about a little bit about your collaborations. Yeah. You know, there's the Gloaming, uh, the Martin Hayes Quartet, the Common Ground Ensemble, Brooklyn, working with the Brooklyn Rider Quartet. Tell me, first of all, what were you aspiring to do with the Gloaming when you put that group together? Yeah, I, you know what, I, I, I don't think I had a, a, a particular aspiration at all or any expectation of anything really. I was just kind of in a phase of doing things. I'm going to do another thing, I'm going to do another thing, I'm going to do another thing. And it was kind of, um, and I had this kind of touring ensemble called, called the Masters of Tradition on tour that with Martin O'Connor and Carl Hayden and Ilo Leonard and a bunch of us like you know uh, so and then I can't remember what they oh yeah Irla wanted to do something with Dennis and me and I was going I couldn't hear it like I, I just couldn't see how it would work you know but I, I, I was experimenting um, some time after that with uh, Thomas Bartlett in a studio just doing a kind of a day of recording like yeah. just for the fun of it and I thought, no, actually, Irla, if Dennis and Thomas and I played, I could actually see Irla fitting into that. So I thought, okay, so that's, that's the band. And then I, I went home and I kind of slept on that, and I thought, oh, that's a way of working with Irla. But then I, I suddenly realized, like, oh, this is a lot of guitar and piano, like, just weighing down on top of the fiddle. Like, and at the same time, I'd been working with Pedro Rida and Quivin O'Reilly, and I thought, Weaving would be good. And so I just put, put that together and and then like booked a concert at the concert hall. <laughs> and voila, <laughs> that's it. Like, then there's a band. But, but, <laughs> but, but a lot happened over those four albums. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, the gloaming developed its own sound, really. It, you it know, did, it was yeah. quite a unique sound. It did, yeah. I was kind of curious about it, like, as, you know, what it was developing into, you know, and like, I remember for the first year, I kept thinking, ah, this is what the band is about. Oh no, this is what, no, you know, this is the way we're going to go. So we had a lot of like, you, you know, there, there was, it, it emerged gradually, you know, um, in the first year, but we, we, we did, um, but some of it just kind of came out, like, like the first thing we did was we went to Grouse Lodge, the recording studio, just to rehearse for a few days to kind of put a band together to play the gig. Mm -hmm. So we had the gig, the gig was sold out. We didn't have the band yet. <laughs> and uh, so, we, so we put the band together. Okay. And so like, I, I took a lot of stuff that Dennis and I had done. Nice. I just kind of shoved it right into this like mix. And so Thomas was just right on it and Quivine was also like, so it just like, nobody had to tell anybody to do anything. Yeah. Uh, everybody just kind of knew what to do, so. Okay, I'm definitely coming to questions now, but just the Common Ground Ensemble, though. Yeah. It's kind of moving a little bit into the avant-garde at certain times. Yeah, yeah. So what's happening now with your sort of thinking about collaborations? Uh, well, let's see. Um, that one, I, 
I kind of I, I kind of dreamed that one up as well, like just kind of. I, I I was actually sitting on the beach in 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 like uh, um, Spain, like <laughs> thinking like Gary at the concert hall has said, you should put another band together now, you know, like to do these concerts. And I go, all right, all right, all right. Just do, just p p whatever, whoever you want, like. And so I did. Okay. And so, so a lot of the so-called, like the creative ideas don't happen out of me going, I have a creative idea for you. <laughs> and it happens with like saying yes to something and then having to figure it out. Okay. You know, and then okay. having to turn it into something, you know. Like, right. So it happens that way, really. You know? Okay, I suppose that's also everything. the creative process. Like, the everything. Like, okay. Everything I've done has happened that way. Okay. Would you like to ask uh, Martin a uh, question? Anybody, if you just raise your hand. Anything about what you've heard or his music? Yes, if you speak. Uh, good le good yeah, loud, yeah, actually. Yeah. yeah. Okay. With, with the gloaming, Martin, would you ever go into a concert and not have every single note worked out? I mean, with the gloaming, I think of a habit of whether it's, I mean, it looks like you're going off on tangents and you're all looking at each other as if to say, you combine beautifully, but yeah. do you ever, literally, have you ever been sitting where you're going, where are we going next? <laughs> well, uh, have I, the question would be, have I ever gone on the stage knowing exactly what I'm going to do? <laughs> like, would be a more accurate description of it. Like, uh, I, I, like uh, for me, the, the definition of a good gig is that we would go on tangents, like, and that things could happen, you know? Like, like I have this idea that, like a fundamental quality of, of performance, I think, is the feeling of its aliveness, like that, that it's actually happening in front of you, that decisions are being made in that moment and, uh, and choices are being, being made and things are happening unbidden in a certain way. And that for me is like, feels like that's an important quality for an audience and for a band, for musicians as well. Like Dennis and I used to have a, a little segment in, in a concert every night, which was basically like kind of free improvisation. It wasn't meant to be great or anything like that, but it was always very interesting because mm. we'd walk into this space not knowing anything that was going to happen. Mm. But that was very good for us because it would improve the rest of the concert dramatically, mm. like having kind of done that for just a few minutes. Uh, because you, you, you kind of let go and relax and you uh, allow things to happen. I, I feel like the word allow is a better word than make when it comes to music sometimes. Mm -hmm. you know, like it, it's as much about allowing it to happen as it is to force it to happen. You know? Okay. Thank you. Could we have another question? Here we are. Hi, Mark. In terms of tunes and tunes you select to apply your special touch to your style to, do you have a backlog of tunes that, that you're st or, or tunes that you still think I really want to do my version of that? And also, are there particular types of tunes that you would do anywhere near, or like let's say polkas or something like that? You go, know, Jesus, I never, I'll never release my version of polka. Or something. You're, you're very you're very on the ball there like, it's not, like, like, there are not too many quotes on my albums I feel like it's kind of like coming from here like it's a kind of a uh, cultural uh, uh, appropriation is that the word that, like, 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 like that, that, that I, I'm not fully entitled to go down there and take those polkas um, but but I, I do actually love polkas and slides actually I think they're, they're really uh, underrated and, and incredibly wonderful music um, the the tunes uh, like there's a lot of it is kind of just like one thing that just happened in the long we would be doing a sound check and I just start noodling you know uh, like a tune just for just and the next thing I go Thomas is on it Dennis is on it okay I wasn't going to choose this tune for anything and the next thing I know we're playing it that night in the key <laughs> you know and that's like a, a lot has happened just like that you know just like, like if I'm not careful, like I'll end up like performing the tune, you know, and and I want it's just like nude, like something, you know. But and and there is like a, a backlog of tunes that go all the way back to my childhood that I still love to play, and and I'm still learning tunes, and I still have a I have a, an iTunes playlist called Tunes to Learn, <laughs> and, and I, I, I dip in there every now and again and kind of uh, you know fish out a few tunes and. Uh, yeah. Okay. Here's another question. Where does music come from? <clears throat> Sorry. 
where, 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 where does the music come from? You, you mentioned noodling. Is there a difference when you're, if you're writing? I, I'm, I'm not a writer of music, but yeah, yeah. I, I, I listen. Um, is there a difference between improvisation and actually writing? Yeah, or where, 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 where do the sounds, did, did, did it come from water flowing? Where do the sounds, yeah, yeah. music sounds come from? Well, like, um, I, 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 yeah, like, like I, I don't write that much music, but um, when I do, you kind of just kind of like have to allow ideas to emerge like out of nowhere, you know, like they, like it has to come out of somewhere, you know, like so you get a little kernel of something, you know, that happens maybe accidentally. Uh, or, you know, it's a bit like that idea of just throwing things at the wall and see, see what sticks. Uh, and so you get, you get a kernel of something to work with. And then you're kind of in a, a fixing and sorting out. Then you're, you're you, be, be, before you know it, you're kind of problem solving. You're going, there's something wrong with this tune here. This isn't right this way. I, no, it needs to go in another direction here or something. So, so it gets fairly mundane a, after a little while. But it, but it, it, it does start with like, like uh, what I was saying there earlier, that idea of allowing, you know, um, like, like so, so I would improvise yeah. to create something. And that, and that is kind of a way of letting ideas emerge <laughs> yeah. that, that you're not that consciously aware of, that, you, 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 that I wouldn't be able to make that choice. So so, yeah. so 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 I might get something from from an improvisation. So any time I'm asked to write anything, I just start smothering all kinds of like ideas. I just let it. I I have a recording system on the on the computer at home, like where um, where where I can kind of keep looping there, and I can just keep like coming up with another version and another version mm. and another version and another version, and then I I I I'll take a listen back and go, is there anything in there, you know? Mm. And there might be some nice things, you know. And, and a few nice notes, you know, and like, so then you have something to work with, something to develop, and then there's a bit of grunt work, I suppose, that comes with it after that, you know. I, uh, does that answer you? Yes, yes, it does. Yes, yes. Yes. Can we have another question? Please, here we are. Uh, hello, Martin, it's uh, lovely to meet you. Um, I was just wondering, um, you know, you like tips or advice for um, young musicians, like with the fiddle, that you kind of learned along the way? Oh, uh, advice for young musicians. Um, uh, I would say, um, I'd say one one thing that probably doesn't happen enough for young musicians is the encouragement to play from a place of feeling, um, and because there's the assumption that like kids lack the maturity to to have that experience, which from my own experience I know is not true. And, um, and I, the reason I say to, to begin to experience to play music from a feeling point of view is that if you spend a lot of your life not doing that, then you are practicing how to play without that. And it becomes difficult to inject that part of it back into your playing procedure. So as much as you would be learning how to master the instrument, you're also learning how to connect with the music as you play and how to connect with your own feelings and to allow that to happen, I would say, is a very important thing because the feeling will help you shape the piece of music and, uh, and, and guide you in a certain way. Thank you very much. That's an excellent question. A pretty good answer as well. Would, would we have one more question? Yeah. Martin, honoured to be here. Um, you talked about Chicago um, and how it was a bit of a pivotal point in your music journey. I'm just wondering, did you have to leave Ireland in order to come back to it? Uh, I, I, I mean, I've, I've lived most of my life abroad, I, I suppose, in fairness, but I, I feel, I, I don't feel like I've ever left, like, on some level. Um, and I, I kind of rambled into Chicago. I did. I had no idea I was immigrating. <laughs> like, I actually thought I was just going to be there for a little while. And um, uh, 
and one thing led to another, you know. So it, it, it like, when I went there, I, I just, yeah, I, I don't know. Like, I, I'm the opposite of a person with a plan, you know. Like, like I, I, I had no plan, really. And, and the longer I was at this, the further and further and more removed the idea of a plan in life became. Like, I, I, I simply could not plan my life out. So I, I just, like, followed the music. And, like, I followed wherever that took me. And, and just hoped to God that that would somehow work out, you know. Um, but, like, it comes with absolutely no guarantees at all. And... Um, so, like, I think maybe in those years in Chicago, I was a bit kind of, like, uh, idealistic and, like, silly in, in a way, you know, kind of just w willing to, like, like, like that monk, you know, I have my boat pushed out to sea and see where it takes me. Mm. So there was a bit of that, you know, because I had left it too late to make other plans. Mm. And I felt I'll, get, I'll just hop in that boat and see where it goes. That's it. Okay. Okay. We're, draw we're drawing to a close. Um, can I just ask for one final question, which is for a man without a plan, are there things you would like to do in the future? Are there anything you're thinking about that you would like to do? Um, I, 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 I'm drawn to like collaboration, uh, I like the idea of what music can do in other f facets of life. You, you know, the, there's a like I, I had engaged in kind of leadership conferences and things of that nature down in Ballybon, and I was really enjoying the conversation and dialogue that happens around music and around other areas of life. Um, I enjoy um, uh, I enjoy to teach as well a certain <coughs> amount um, to philosophize, to think, to imagine, to dream, and uh, so I, I kind of want to create like life situations where I can do that, you know, more, and where I can kind of just reach out from beyond the typical place of being on a stage to perform, but to actually be more in a circle with people, if that makes sense. That sounds like a plan. <laughs> okay. Um, Martin, thank you very much for our conversation today, which I've really enjoyed. I, I think, I'm sure everybody found it very interesting. So um, maybe if you join me in thanking Martin, and maybe just to finish up, you play a tune just to conclude the evening. Would that be okay? Sure, of course. Yeah. Okay, well, let's thank Martin for it. Why didn't you play something you're going to play tonight? Oh, well, I don't know what I'm going to play. <laughs>